Filmmaking is the new garage band. Welcome to Frame Lines, a show about people making movies. Frame Lines is brought to you in part by Sabo Studios, gear for the show. Tape Central, providing your media needs. Production Partners Media, affordable media solutions. And by grants from the Greater Columbus Arts Council and the Ohio Arts Council. Richard Hatch talks about his life and his career in film and television. I, I've always been in this business almost now, um, Jesus, um, 45 years now. And I started when I was 20, and, and I started in New York, and I was on All My Children. I was the original children of All My Children, along with um, uh, Susan Lucci, the famous daytime queen of soap opera. She was one of the children, you know, always trying to break up me and my girlfriend. And then uh, I was doing plays, and, and I did a musical off-Broadway called Love Me, Love My Children. And then I moved back to L.A. Uh, and did a whole bunch of guest star roles on Hawaii Five-0, The Waltons, um, uh, Medical Center, shows like that. And then I ended up uh, replacing Michael Douglas on Streets of San Francisco with Carl Mullen. From that, I uh, got cast in Battlestar Galactica without ever having to read. Um, and played Captain Apollo on the biggest budgeted TV series in history at the time. And then I've done a slew of, like I said, uh, uh, so many episodic and movies of the week and I was even on Santa Barbara which is another soap for a while um, and then I've just done a lot of little uh, indie projects that, that I find interesting uh, and I started writing novels and books uh, I've written seven Battlestar books I now have this new series called Guam which I'm developing and I wrote uh, coming out as an online um, social networking game coming out as a novelization next next year. It'll also be a series of graphic novels. It's a new big epic sci-fi series. I'm, I'm into very visionary, intelligent sci-fi. Uh, I've never been one for cheesy sci-fi. It's not my thing. Well, I went out, and went out, went out and uh, wrote a whole script, and then we went out and shot for about a year, almost. Weekends here, there, everywhere that we could, shooting, uh, and I had like an epic I mean, I had like so much film, and then I put it together into about 20, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and I remember playing it for Volker Engel, and he looked at it and said, well, you got a problem here. I said, he said, you know, to really make this look right, make it look good, and you're, the post and the CGI and all the stuff you're gonna have to do is gonna cost you a fortune. He says, my suggestion to you is to cut it down to a trailer. And so he took me over to Dreamscape, and uh, they did the, some of the um, modeling for the ships. Um, and then they did some of the compositing. And I started learning about all of that. And then uh, we also did the first edit. They did the first edit with me over there, which is a two minute thing. And then uh, I brought it back. Uh, and all the stuff that we'd shot before, uh, I basically, uh, with Jay Wolfel, and, uh, and Scott, we, I, we borrowed shots from all that stuff we'd shot before, and we built the two minute into a four minute. And then we got Dean Cundey to come over for one day and shoot uh, with his equipment uh, and a cold hamburger, and we shot some extra shots that day, and then we just kind of put together the best of all of it, you know, and uh, ended up with a trailer that uh, debuted at uh, Dragon Con that got this, it was like most powerful moment of my life to have the absolute silence at the end of this trailer and everybody had heard about this trailer, this mythological Battlestar trailer that nobody knew if it was real or not. And then all of a sudden here comes this 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 panel and they're gonna play the trailer and it was like all these Battlestar fans came out of the woodwork and everybody showed up and we had got thousands of people in there. It was huge. And we played it and there was absolute silence at the end of it. I'm thinking, oh, they hated it, you know, and, and that's the worst fear because fans are pretty particular. If you screw up things or change things too much and... Just ask the Well, my whole, my whole premise was not to change it, 
but to build upon it so that I kept all the underpinnings of the original Battlestar, but that I up-leveled the ships, the designs, the technology, right? And, 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 and added things without changing the feeling, the energy of it. And so I think we accomplished that because after that long silence, there was this amazing explosion of, of cheering for like 10 minutes. Every filmmaker, everybody should have that moment of, of joy, of feeling like you hit a home run. And there was tears in people's eyes. Well, believe it or not, I took that trailer everywhere. I mean, after we played it at several conventions, Dragon Con, we got all this notice, and we got all these rave reviews, and then Miramax called me, thinking nobody made a trailer back then. When I wanted to make a trailer 10 years ago, everybody laughed. You don't make a trailer without making the movie. Nobody made trailers without a movie back then. Uh, ultimately, it was a labor of love by so many creative people coming together to work together and then ultimately doing the impossible. And then when we actually had a trailer that actually blew people away, especially 10 years ago when CGI was in its infancy, uh, nobody could believe we did what we did. And Harvey Weinstein calls up and I'm freaked out. I couldn't even call back because I was terrified. I thought, I'm going to go to jail. You know, Universal didn't know we shot it. We didn't have a license. We weren't shooting it to make money, but we were shooting it as a presentation to inspire a revival. And so uh, I honestly didn't know what to say. You know, he thought, well, you couldn't, make the, you couldn't make this trailer without having the movie, and you must own it. Otherwise, you wouldn't have done it. You know, so I, 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 I didn't know, I really didn't know what to do. I probably should have called him and explained the whole thing, and maybe he would have said, hey, I'll go in with you, which is, by the way, what happened later. Uh, my thought was it wasn't even about doing it without Glenn Larson. I was just trying to inspire a revival of the original show. That was my whole premise. And, and so, like I said, he, he started a lawsuit. And then everybody backed up. Uh, nobody wanted to move forward when he started the lawsuit. They, you know, Patriot Pictures backed up. Everybody, nobody wanted to get involved in all the litigation. I finally had realized Universal. I had taken up the Universal, by the way, and played it for them, to their vice presidents. And they, they were really shocked. They expected to see a little backyard production. They saw something far more sophisticated. They were blown away, but they still couldn't fathom that there was an audience for Battlestar Galactic. Uh, I did one last thing, which was uh, I wanted to do uh, the 25th Battlestar Galactic uh, uh, anniversary, and I co-produced the convention with some of the Dragon Con people. And I did it up at the Universal City Walk. We played Battlestar the movie on the IMAX, believe it or not. It looked amazing. Except for the matte paintings, it actually looked absolutely amazing. And then uh, I invited, I figured, you know, Glenn Larson wanted to do the Pegasus story, and, and then I heard Ron Moore and them were doing a reimagining, and Brian Singer and Tom DeSanto wanted to do a continuation. Everybody wanted to do their own thing, right? Nobody wanted to do what I had put together in the books and the stuff. Everybody wanted to do their own thing, which I get, I understand. And uh, I mean, there's more than one way to do anything. But I figured, okay, it's only going to be fair to invite everybody. Invite them all there, and they can all hash it out and let the fans make up their own mind what they think. And when I watched the four-hour miniseries, I couldn't look at it objectively. I couldn't appreciate it. I didn't, I just, I didn't, I, I just almost wanted to push it away. And the funny part was, it was when it got into the series and they actually started the episodes and they got into space, all of a sudden I'm watching this and then for whatever reasons, the walls came down, the bias and prejudice went out the back window and I was able to really start appreciating the characters, the story, the backstory, and I thought, oh my God, what they were getting into was what I had wanted to get into 30 years earlier. They were actually getting into the core plot of, of a post-apocalyptic world and trying to survive and the life and death struggles of each character, and I, I got blown away by, by the artistry of it. And then when Glenn Larson asked me to come in, I was still torn only because I had invested so much time and energy in, in doing a continuation and had fought so hard for that. But I, I said, you know, I've said no so many times in my life, being the idealistic, brave heart guy, you know. I would crashed and burned so many times out of my idealism and I said, why don't we say yes once and go in and what's going to hurt you to go in and sit down and listen. And I went down in there and I really enjoyed talking to Ron Moore and then the character of a Nelson Mandela style, political revolutionary, really intrigued me. Finally, I said, you know, I, I would love to do this. And uh, he said, well, it's a guest star role, but it could turn into a continuing role. 
and uh, ultimately it did. And anybody that tries anything new that might be a beneficial, but change is hard for people to accept, right? And so it's like movies. Uh, people usually like to copy what was successful before, and most people don't like to really brave new ground uh, because the insecurity is too high and the risk is too high. But, you know, again, I discovered that when people do get upset, you're doing something right, you know? There are going to be people out there that love you, and there are going to be people out there that hate you. And uh, if you're trying to get everybody to love you, you're never going to do anything right in life. You know, so I always tell people, I said, you know, instead of trying to get approval from everybody, just know one thing. When everybody's upset and pissed off, know that you're going in the right direction. <laughs> Peter John Ross takes a moment to show us a filmmaking tip. The Director of Photography, also known as the DP or DOP. The DP is someone who is responsible for the process of photographing a scene in the manner desired by the director. The Director of Photography has a number of possible duties. Selection of film stock, cameras and lenses, designing and selecting lighting, directing the gaffer's placement of lighting, shot composition in consultation with the director, film developing and film printing. On larger shoots, the DP often does not even touch the camera, and that job is done by a camera operator. The difference between a cinematographer and a director of photography depends on the situation. The most common distinction is that a cinematographer is a director of photography that operates his own camera, but that isn't always true. Here's a quick look at the 48-hour film project. I was the director. Production was phenomenal. Everybody came together. I had, a, I had probably four or five people here at the kickoff uh, with me, and we were texting back to uh, the rest of our team that we had. And from the time we drove from here out to the northeast side, the people back at home base had two story ideas. Uh, the people that drove back together had a story idea, bounced them off each other. Uh, we had the full story uh, done within an hour of the kickoff. First rough shot list based on the first draft, even though it's going through revisions, uh, was done by 11. And we actually started shooting at about 3 a.m. Uh, Saturday morning, uh, just on some shots that we knew that we could get. Uh, we were shooting early Saturday because we had one of our actresses on set and two or three crew. We were like, yeah, we can get it. Let's go do it. The only problem we had was uh, even right up to <laughs> shooting, we didn't have a director of photography. We got lucky. We had an intern come over from one of the local companies, and uh, his name's Alex Newman. He had never been a cinematographer before, uh, but he knew his stuff. So I asked him, I said, well, when we go do these shots, you know, these early morning shots, why don't you come with me? I need a camera op. So I had him as camera op. I was setting up the shots. He did so well and had such constructive criticism. I was like, be our cinematographer. And he was like, yeah, absolutely, let's do it. And he worked out fantastically. One of the locations we had some trouble with uh, the white balance on the camera. Everything was turning out blue. There was no way to overcome it. The sun just hated us. So I was like, you know what? We're on time schedule. Let's do this somewhere else. And a lot of people came through for me. And today we got to help out another team by uh, letting them borrow our lighting equipment. We hopped to and uh, ran the lights out there and my gaffer lit their set for them. So it was, it was pretty exciting. This project really reaffirmed my faith in Columbus. Uh, my advice is make friends. First and foremost, had a lot of friends that cut me good deals on rentals. Everything was cheap or loaned to us. Make sure everyone on set knows their job and follows it and doesn't step on people's toes. Aiden 5 is an amazing science fiction series from director John Jackson, producer Ben Bayes, and editor Tim Baldwin, who I sat down with for the roundtable. Let's take a look at Aiden 5. How does it make you feel? All alone. I guess that's the difference between us. I don't feel anything at all. For more than 40 years, Infinity Corporation of America has been a quality brand you know and trust. Shouldn't you be resting? Why? Did you solve the case? I'm Charles Maybaugh, Vice President of Operations. Is there something I can help you with? One of our lead detectives is suspected of murdering three surrogates. If you don't mind, we'd like you to turn over the creation history of his clones. Yes, I do mind. 
All departmental cloning goes through Infinity. Anything else would be illegal. Are you crazy? I can't take you there. They'll kill me. I search the premises. I want creation logs, databases, computer archives. If it has to do with cloning, pack it up. Infinity is gunning for us. You're not safe. I need answers. Get down! There are still some things I need to figure out for myself. Tread lightly, Detective. Has anyone seen the shooter? He's disengaged now! I have my answer and now he's gone! I'm your partner! What did you do to them? What did you do to us? Things have gotten out of control. It would seem so, sir. First, let's talk a little bit about kind of how do you get started in filmmaking. So, John, tell us a little bit first about how did you first get involved in any kind of filmmaking at all? Like, did you start when you were a kid? Yeah, yeah. My older brother uh, had a Super 8 camera, and uh, he had it for his family. He's about, about a 10-year age difference. So he bought it for his kids, and then I borrowed it and started making movies, and he never got it back. So I owe him a Super 8 camera. But, yeah, that was it. Went down the basement. Long days doing st I started doing stop animation stuff stop motion stuff, very, very poorly done, but, um, you know, I was making use of it, all the toys I had, <laughs> taking clay, taking G.I. Joe's, you name it, and trying to, to do stuff like that, so, and it just stuck. Ben, how did you get started? Very much the same way Johnny did. My, uh, my dad had an 8 millimeter camera, and so as a kid, you know, he would always be making home movies, and then later he got a VHS camcorder, and I thought that was the coolest thing in the world, because I could put it in and watch it instantly. So we just invite my friends over, you know, on the weekends, and we'd film these movies and, and the stories, and then we'd also do, like, plays down in the basement or stop motion. You know, a lot of the same style types of things, so. Timmy? Same, same way, you know, <laughs> just growing up loving film and, oh, somebody's got a video camera, let's go do something on the weekend and that's the way, it, you know, it just, that's the way we did it. Had to put, you know, we had to edit with two VCRs, you know, with an AB roll and hope you got it right and, hey, look what I made, so, we went to school for it, so. You went to school for it? Where'd you go to school for it? Bowling Green, State University. So. Did you go to school for film at all? I did. I went to Los Angeles Film Studies Center. Johnny? No, I went to Columbus College of Art and Design and got kicked out after my first year. <laughs> so, no formal studies, yeah. But uh, you each kind of work in the industry right now. What do you do currently kind of, like, to make a living but still film-related, media-related? What do you do? Uh, I'm a producer and director for Mills James Productions here in town. I did um, a few years at uh, Horizons Companies is where I started. Started in the basement doing tape op stuff and uh, took every dirty job that came along, said, yes, I can do it, yes, I'll do it, and faked my way through it for a while, and ended up at a TV station where I met Ben after that, and then, um, and then finally here, I've been there just over four years at Mills, so. And I'm an executive producer, director on a, a show for the Big Ten Network for WSU here in town, and um, we produce, uh, it's a magazine style, um, information technology show that we do once a month and so and that's pretty much like a lot of the content for the big ten network that is not sports related right Right, it's non-sports programming so um, you know if you see guys up on mountains drilling ice cores or driving the mars rover around you know mars that's that's the the type of discovery channel style programming that we do what do you do timmy <laughs> <laughs> i'm a freelance video film an editor and producer. I work mostly at uh, Wendy's International. So, but uh, you worked at other places before that too. I though? worked at the Media Group for four years as a PA and a grip. And then I said, I in this town, if you want to become a director, at the at the moment it felt it felt like the only way to become a director is to become a director of photography first. It had that feel to it, and I can't light a room for <laughs> to save my life. But so I decided to be an editor, and I was an editor there, and then I moved out to L.A. for a while, then came back, and I was back at the media group as the lead editor at the media group for four years, and then they disbanded, and I've been freelance ever since. So I work at Wendy's International mostly, but I've worked at Mills James, and that's where I met Johnny yeah. at Mills James. So, but I was freelancing there, so. So kind of looking at more currently, is like, what do you think of the current, like, filmmaking scene as a whole, like, do you feel like the whole digital video movement of the last 10 years has really affected filmmaking? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, 
I think it's like that, going back to the, the industrialization of <laughs> America. I mean, it's, it's, it's happening so fast and so rapidly. Like, it, I mean, it, it can't keep up. I mean, we have a little age difference between uh, the three of us here, but uh, the knowledge, you know, that's being tossed around and, and it's amazing, you know. I mean, you blink and you're behind the curve. Um, again, I, just, I look at what kids have nowadays that I would have killed for. I, I, by the way, I never edited. I never edited when I was a kid. I did it all in camera. Everything I did was in camera. I never touched an edit system. Yeah, and you had that um, little rainbow line yeah. you were editing in VHS, you know, yeah. and that's what you had. You had your, those you, takes and that was it. You, yeah. you couldn't, you oh, couldn't do anything. You mean I'm supposed to start him before? Right, right. But now <laughs> it's action. so accessible to everybody. You yeah. know, everybody has a editing system that ships with their operating system. Yeah, there's iMovie yeah. with, with any Mac and there's Windows Movie Maker with yeah. any PC. I mean, right out of the gate, you have 90% of the editing tools available <laughs> it's right yeah. there for free. If you have a cell phone, you have a camera, you know, if you have <laughs> friends, yeah. you have actors and, you know, you can, you can shoot and edit and distribute anything now. Yeah. Yeah, just the, the, the power of what's going on, it's kind of like, but how does that affect you, having that you're coming from this area of being more or less professionals? How did kind of the digital video movement kind of affect you? I mean, it, in terms of like, did it suddenly make it even more accessible for you, or did you always feel that I've had this? Because I think it's I, the thing I've noticed with the three of you is kind of like it wasn't until the last few years that suddenly started doing kind of the indie filmmaking movement. I mean, or have you been doing it this whole time and just it wasn't as well known now that there's a community? Yeah, I think you're right. I think I didn't think about it that way. Is now it's everything's more because when I worked at the media group, obviously I had I had yeah. the tools to do a lot of things, but it was beta cam. You know, it wasn't anything worth anything. Yeah, I still could have made something, but it wouldn't have. There was no there was no market for it. Like in the, you know what I mean for <laughs> something now with eight and five, even with eight and five, or something like that. It's a web series. I mean, you can make things that so many people can see right away. But back then, it was it just you make it for fun. I mean, we made so many yeah. things for fun, which is fine. That's it's the way to go. But, but then they a, wouldn't be. Seen. But they wouldn't be right, seen right. professionally. Like, man, maybe this could. Maybe somebody I, really cool would like this. Or. And I think that's what you're seeing now is that groups of people and communities are organizing around the fact that their stuff can be seen by their friends. Mm -hmm. You know, you can put them in in, uh, in Vimeo. You can you can put them in different uh, groups. And so there's a lot more. Uh, of an audience and you kind of have more fan bases whereas we would make our movie show it to our friends and family and that would be it and then we go on to the next project or whatever so. our Christmas videos at the, yeah. at the media group it's like we <coughs> loved them yeah. we showed them to our friends and they would be like that's not funny but <laughs> at least somebody saw them you know so yeah. that was really that's where they stopped yeah kind of the YouTubeization like of everything is at this point it's yeah. an instant audience at the very least you can like, you know, Facebook and social networking you put something out there, you have a circle of friends with their circle of friends that all could see a video at this point. I mean, it'll be interesting to see kind of where that, where that takes us or where we're being led to because it's, um, you know, some people, I remember when the digital stuff first came out and I think I was at Horizons, I mean, it was, it was just being knocked on like, oh great, everybody's going to be out there and it's lowering the quality that's acceptable. That's that was what the thought was. It's lowering the quality of what's acceptable, what the viewer will take. And I just remember that sticking out in my head, thinking like, well, that's not necessarily. That doesn't have to be that way. You can still push to try to do things, you know, a certain way. And I think I think in some cases the opposite <clears throat> is true because while there is more bad products out there, there's a lot of great stuff that we would never have seen or have access to. So yeah. I think. Yes, there's just more of it out there, and you have to, it's it's a lot harder to sift through and find you know the the good products that are out there in the market. But at the same time, I'm seeing some amazing stuff being shot on these you know DSLRs <laughs> right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, speaking, that are, of, speaking of DSLRs, I mean, you talk about how fast things change. The DSLRs yeah. in one year, these yeah. still cameras that can do video are suddenly producing video that looks very high end professional. Uh, yeah. yeah. House, I think you. The, yeah, you know, I, I, I made a big thing like recently House online was, about an episode, a lot of more than one episode of House. No, no, it? just the was final, it just the final entire one, episode I think. of the shot. But an entire episode of House, House MD yeah. was shot with a consumer <laughs> still camera shooting video with stock lenses. Yeah, 
uh, and the fact that you know it's that was indistinguishable watching it in HD next to what they shoot on 35 millimeter film, that's actually terrifying for the industry in that a $2,000 yeah. camera replacing the $100,000 Panavision camera. Uh, you know, I don't know if they're gonna. They're probably not gonna switch that regularly. But again, it's the accessibility of these cameras under two grand and under a thousand bucks, yeah. being able to shoot very filmic images. It's changing the game, yeah. and, it, and it takes the control out of being in someone else's hands or a third party hand. Now the filmmaker um, doesn't have to wait or rely on someone to be discovered or to be given the money to make their film. Mm. They can. If they want to, and they're not getting the the notice or the exposure they're looking for, they can just go make their film. So, uh, tell me about some of the other products you've done as an actor, like over the last few years. Uh, well, I, st I I really didn't start doing. Um, I tried I tried to make a movie with John Jackson back in 1987. Is the first time he and I I had access to something called a camcorder, which was not just a video <laughs> camera, but you could actually like tape. With the cam and it, people today, they just take for granted you put the tape in the camera. But back then, it was a camera with a wire that went to a VCR that you strapped to, the, to your side. And I had access to one of these. And uh, we were in high school, and we were setting out to make a, a uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark type uh, story. It was called Indiana Jones and the Towers of Tahiara. It was a story that I was working on, and uh, that got sidelined. It never saw the light of day, but uh, we had a blast messing with all that stuff. Love saying this, that's a wrap. We'll see you next time on Framelines.